Yeah, so, so sorry for that brief interruption. So that said, my name is Dr. Ipila Jackie. I'm from Lira University in beautiful Uganda, the Pearl of Africa, and I'm your moderator for today. And in today's webinar, we will have these three experts in the field of vertical farming, biofertilizers, and the nematodes. So now I'd like to tell you to, to, to sit back, relax, and soak in the knowledge that will be exuded by our scientists um, from their different backgrounds. So first up, we have uh, Dr. Anik. Um, she's from Benin. Um, if she could kindly share her screen with us, then we could start. So Dr. Anik, as her bio is already indicating on the screen, she is a PhD holder. She graduated from Ghent University in 2018. And currently she's a postdoctoral fellow um, in Ireland where she's based at the Southeast Technological University in the Department of Applied Science in the Republic of Ireland. And she's an expert in nematology as we've already said. And right now she's working on investigating the use of beneficial nematodes as a biocontrol in insect pests and other uses in ecotoxicology. If you'd like to get a hold of Anik, post this online cafe. I would encourage you to email her, drop her an email. Her email is on your screen. And we will also be able to share this in the chat uh, with time, as well as you can follow her on Twitter or on LinkedIn, um, which is different social media platforms. So Anik, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Anik, you are muted, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was too excited actually <laughs> to be part of this, this uh, communication today. It's a very interesting topic that we brought up uh, today. And um, I'm really happy to share my knowledge, especially the role the nematode play in the sustainability. So as uh, all of us, are aware, we, we know the damage that the use of chemical pesticides and uh, fertilizers cause to our, our environment and uh, to our human health. It's causing, they are causing a lot of damage and around the world, all of us are trying from our different uh, field of expertise, we're trying to reduce the use of these fertilizers and to provide, on the other hand, a sustainable solution to improve productivity and also environmental health. So that being said, in the Europe, one of the policy of European Union is to reduce the use of this chemical by 50% by 2030. That's in very short term. By 2030, we want to reduce the amount of chemical we are applying in soil and in other ecosystem by 50%. And also the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, the number 12, if I'm correct, is to ensure the sustainable production and consumption patterns. That means that we want to sustain the livelihoods of current and future generation. So I'm really happy, as I just said, to share the role of nematodes in cultivating sustainable future. Go to next slide. So I'll start by telling you what are nematodes. What are nematodes? You know, nematodes, uh, those small worms, unsegmented, they are not segmented like the earthworm. They are small worm. They are mostly microscopic worm that you cannot see with your eyes. And they are considered to be the most abundant soil animal in soil on earth. They count for more than 80% of all animal that lives in soil. And they can be found in all habitats around the globe. We can find them even in Antarctica, nematodes are there. So usually there are different ways of grouping these nematodes. In terms of habitats, we can group them 
as a free living, the one that live freely, whether it's in water, it can be marine or fresh water, or the one that live freely in soil. Those one, I, as you can see in this picture below, you can so, just take soil sample and get free living nematode in it. Some of them can be, as you can see on the picture, they can be parasitic, even to the extent of killing those nematodes as well. We have the parasite groups. And one group is the, the nematode that can infect the vertebrates, like human being. I've just put here one picture. It's not looking so nice. Well, I don't know, most of the people from Africa, you should be familiar with this disease we call elephantiasis. It's caused by a nematode, which is a branch of T. And this is a nematode that is insect borne. It's transmitted to human by mosquito, mos mosquito. We also have nematodes that are pathogen to insects. Those are the entomopathogenic nematodes. They are obligate parasites of insects, and we use them to control pest parasites in plants. Below, I put the phy phytoparasite. These are nematodes that parasite plants. And they are the mostly known around the world because they cause a lot of damage to our crops. You can see the carrots looking not so nice because of root knot nematodes. These are girl nematodes. So in terms of feeding behaviors, we can also classify nematodes in five different groups. The one that feed on bacteria, we have the one that feed on fungi, we have the plant parasite nematode that I've just talked about. We have the predators and we have the omnivores that can feed on both bacteria and fungi. And depending on the level of the population, the amount of population of this nematode in soil, we can use them as bioindicator. What do I mean? You see, example, we have something that we call CP, CP calls. We give them number from one to five, starting from the bacteria, feeders to the, the predators and omnivores. And suppose that in soil, we sample soil and we found that we have uh, a lot of predators of, or omnivores. This nematode, this group of nematodes, they have soft skin, and they are really sensitive to disturbance in soil. So in a polluted soil, these nematodes, they don't live there. They move for a better place. So when we take soil sample and, and notice that there is few quantity of this nematode, it can already give us information on the health of the soil. That we're dealing with soil that has been disturbed. If we have the bacteria, Feeders, for example, these ones are considered as opportunists. When there is bacteria, when there is dead material on the ground, you all know we have this, uh, we have the uh, bacteria and fungi, these microorganisms who helps to break down the dead material into small pieces. And the nematodes, they feed on this bacteria to help decomposition. And in another way, while feeding up bacteria, they released nutrients which are readily available for the plants. The plants can take up the nutrients more easily, like ammonium or phosphorus. So these nematodes are involved in nutrient cycling in soil. So they contribute to the soil health. So in my next few slides, I'm going to emphasize on the nematodes, the beneficial nematode, the one that I just say we use to control pest insects in agriculture. These are the entomopathogenic nematodes, but I'll try to call them just beneficial nematodes, not to bring a lot of terminologies here. So in the last 10 years of my research, I mostly focus on these nematodes. I studied a lot of aspects, of them and as I say, we use them in biological control of insect pests. We can cultivate them in industrial, as you can see in the first slide, in big tank, 
we can try to reproduce these nematodes and have a lot of quantity that can be applied in field. We can also use the traditional method, which is using insect pests. There is an insect that we call Galeria melonella. This insect is really easy to multiply and to buy also on the market. So we can use them to also reproduce the nematode, have a large quantity and apply in crop system. They are very, these nematodes are very easy to multiply, as just said. They are cost effective. They cause no harm to the environment or human being. So, I'm trying to move to the, okay, to the next slide. So, one of my recent research focused on the use of this beneficial nematode to control fruit flies. When I say fruit fly, don't think about drosophila. It's not drosophila. This is a different group of fruit flies. And uh, the main invasive damaging species is the Bactrocera dorsalis. So what did we do? It's to use this beneficial nematode to control the effects of this insect in mango cultivation. Mango, it's a fruit that we we eat a lot in West Africa. You can see on the picture, it's a very, very, I, I personally like this fruit. But when this pest attack, we can even reach a point that we lose the whole orchard. They can cause a lot of damage, over 75% in Benin, my country. So this nematode, the infective stage live in soil is the only life stage of the nematode that live in soil. The other part that happens uh, inside the insect host. So we use the beneficial nematode to target the pupa and the larval stage of the fruit flies. So you can see of the life cycle, all the other uh, stages of the pest happens above ground, but in soil, the third insta larvae has to jump in soil, go for go to pupation before we have the adults. So we target those two stages and we got fantastic results. We were able to achieve 99% larva mortality using three different species of nematode, which were all native to Benin. And even the pupae, which has very hard skin, the nematode were able to penetrate, to puncture that skin and kill the pupae as well. One very important characteristic of the biological agent is to be able, the, the, the organisms has to be able to, pers to reproduce and persist in soil. Otherwise, you'll be just applying. So this is very good characteristic. So we look at the reproduction of our nematode inside uh, Bactrocera dorsalis. And we saw that, as you can see on the pictures, they were really happy to reproduce and give several generations inside a larvae. So this was a very good result which gave us the courage to move to the formulation of this nematode for field application. So we tried, you know, in West Africa, the weather can be really harsh sometimes, where the, the, it's really dry or the temperature is so high, but this nematode are really sensitive to temperature. So we were trying to use different substrates to formulate the nematode. We, used the biochar and compost in different, uh, I would say in different combinations to apply directly in field and see how the efficacy is. The study is still ongoing, but we are having very promising results. Right now in my lab here in Ireland, I have a PhD student in our group, Islam Dawish. Islam is uh, working on the development of the biological control product for sustainable plant health. What, is, what she is basically doing 
is to combine the same beneficial nematodes I've been talking about, a different species, of course, with the bacteria Pseudomonas ogari. This is considered as a bio fertilizers because these bacteria help the plants to grow well. It promotes plant growth and also help the plant to take nutrients appropriately. So the next speakers will explain you more about what we consider as a bio fertilizers. She will give us more insight on that. But what we consider in my lab as bioconsidered are these microorganisms. It can be bacteria, it can be fungi that help to promote plant growth and help also in nutrient uptake. So this lady is combining these two micro, these two organisms, this nematode and the bacteria at the same time to apply on soft fruit against the effect of black vine weevil. This is a pest that destroy both the larval stage and the adult stage cause a lot of damage to the strawberry plant. So she's also trying to formulate them in a kind of bead, as you can see on the pictures, alleginate beads to make it one product. And so far she's found that these two organisms can collaborate, they can, they tolerate each other very well. They don't cause any negative effect to each other. So when we, she applied them together, they work perfectly. The nematode work to, as, like, to kill the insect and the bacteria promote the plant health. So at the same time, it's helping the plant to be healthy and then to control the insect pests. And this is a very, very good research. And I'm, I personally am really looking forward to <laughs> the, the final product because it's going to be really a very good solution for sustainable control of this pest in agriculture. Myself, currently, I'm using EPN, as I say on at the beginning of my speech, I'm using them as bio indicator. Well, what I might do, what I'm doing right now is, uh, you know, in soil we have heavy metal. These are metal. These are component in soil that are not good for our health. They can cause a lot of damage to our health as a human. They also destroy the quality of the soil. So since we don't have time and money to run the conventional analysis by analyzing by chemical analysis of soil to look at, all the, we look for model organisms, these organisms that look, live in soil and go like can survive the disturbance, the stress that happens in soil. We look for model organisms that can tell us about the status of the soil, the health of the soil. So in my case, I'm look, I'm using this beneficial nematode to see how much they can tell us about chromium cis. That's one particular uh, heavy metal in soil. How much they can tell us about the chromium cis risk assessment in soil. So I'm running a lot of experiment now to see how the compounds affect the biology of the nematode. So then we can look for uh, we call it endpoint, a measurable, you know, result to, to be able to move forward. So then we can provide a protocol and people can easily use instead of chemical analysis. Right. Biofertilizers also have been uh, proved, like has been um, said in the literature that they can also help to control plant parasitic nematode. I'm now talking about the bad nematode, the one that attacks our plants. So we can use this bacteria or fungi to control the plant parasitic nematode. I have this study here that was done in Benin and they used abuscular mycorrhiza fungi. This is a beneficial fungi 
to control the effect of root node nematodes. So another one in India, I think they also, but they use bacteria. And there's also a product on the market that is formulated based on two different bacteria, Bucoderia and Bacillus. And it's also used as bio nematicide. So these biofertilizers can also help us to control the bad nematodes. They help to reduce, for example, the root node nematode multiplication by reducing the number of gas of eggs, like the developmental stage of this animal. So it helps also to protect the plant against the bad nematode. So to sum up, nematodes contribute a lot in sustainable agriculture and ecosystem services. As I said, nematodes, they can be used as biocontrol agent to sustainably control plant pest enemy. They can also, they are also used and contribute a lot in nutrient cycling. And the free living nematodes serve as bioindicator for soil health. Looking at the interaction between these two organisms, I mean the biofertilizers and the nematode. I've said biofertilizers can be used to control plant parasitic nematode, example, the root non nematode, by reducing the multiplication. They can also, when we combine them together with biofertilizers, they are very compatible and their combination is very, very great product that help us to control crops best and also uh, promote soil health. So thank you so much for your attention. And I thank uh, everyone that makes this webinar possible. <laughs> thank you and thank you, Dr. Ipila. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Anik. And for our online listeners who have just logged on, um, there's a little bit of uh, something that you need to know. We will, we will have three presentations. So the first one has been given by Dr. Nick, and then we have two other presenters. But I ask you to post your questions on the chat. We will address them at the very end uh, once we're done with all the presentations. And uh, that said, um, I would like to call in our next presenter. That's uh, Miss Mariam. Mariam, uh, maybe um, Sarah, you could help us share um, a little bit of her screen so that I can give a brief uh, on Mariam. Thank you. Uh, so as we wait for the screen to get uh, to be shared, um, I, I hope we are having some th um, thought provoking questions already. You know, we're stirring up questions and please post them. Don't uh, be shy to post on the chat. Um, some of you have already posted questions. We're taking note of them. And at the end, as I've said, we will be able to address all these questions. Do you see the presentation now? You know, kindly share the screen. I think it's on the first page. Eh? Um, it was the, on that very... Could you kindly reshare? So, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm trying my best. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, share. Um... You see it now? Oh yes. Yeah. No. So you could put, no, yeah. Can yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. Um, and as you can see, Miss Mariam Diallo, she's a doctoral uh, candidate currently at UGent, again University. She's in the Department of Agricultural Economics, and she is interested in developmental economics, um, environmental economics, CGE and modeling, as well as econometrics. And if you would like to get in touch with Mariam after this and for future connections or collaborations, feel free to, drop, uh, to con get her on LinkedIn. You could get a uh, chatter up there. And uh, that said, uh, Mariam, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending where you are. So my presentation is uh, titled uh, Cultivating Tomorrow, Empowering uh, African Agriculture with the Use of Bio-Based Fertilizers. 
and it's not just about science it's a journey of uh, transforming uh, the farming uh, system in africa and we will explore how these uh, organic agents can bring positive impact on the field and empower farmers uh, for a better future and at the end also i will share some perspective uh, regarding the development of biofertilizer in the African countries. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so recently, the use of uh, bio-based fertilizer is gaining attention among the agronomists and soil scientists because of its um, considerable, considerable benefits, uh, especially in, in sustainable agriculture and as Anik mentioned, uh, biofertilizers are organic uh, and they involve the use of uh, living organisms to improve soil fertility and promote plant growth. And these organisms are typically bacteria, fungi or algae, and they can fix uh, uh, atmospheric uh, nitrogen and other nutrients for the benefit of the plant. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here are uh, some examples of plant and animal-based biofertilizers. So for the plant base, we have compost, which uh, is a decomposed organic matter, typically uh, derived from plants. Uh, another example is coconut fiber extracted from the hook of uh, coconut. On the other hand, we also, we also have uh, animal-based biofertilizers as uh, uh, manure uh, from animal waste, often from uh, cow, poultry, or other uh, livestock. Uh, next slide, please. Um, using biofertilizers uh, offer a range of advantage in, ag in agriculture. They contribute to the maintenance of soil health, ensuring um, a sustainable and fertile environment for plant growth. And they are also ecologically friendly. They, they pollute less compared to the chemical one. Um, they have uh, an additional benefit of uh, secreting growth regulator that can promote uh, plant development. Um, cost effectiveness is also another positive aspect making them a viable option for farmers seeking for uh, economic, ec economical or sustainable uh, solution. And furthermore, they, they can also contribute to healthier and more resilient. Uh, and they can yeah re reduce uh, disease. Next slide, please. Uh, however, the the adoption of biofertilizers in Africa is facing challenges. Uh, first of all, there is a limited capacity for production at the farmer level. Um, the lack of well-developed distribution network also make it challenging. Uh, for most of African countries, there is no regulation related to biofertilizers, uh, making it tricky. Uh, to enter that they are good quality or not. The lack of awareness is also an issue and there is no big uh, scale production happening yet in most uh, African countries. And all these things together make it hard uh, for the adoption of uh, biofertilizer to become a common and uh, helpful part of agriculture in sustainable agriculture in Africa. And I believe that fixing these challenges will need to involve uh, all stakeholders to work through uh, uh, the use of biofertilizers uh, more accessible for, for farmers. Uh, next slide, please. Now, looking forward, um, the future of biofertilizers uh, depend on important actions that need to be taken. Firstly, there is a need to actively promote fun and advanced research in the field of biofertilizers. 
and investing um, also in the technology uh, behind the use of biofertilizers in the development of effective bacteria or fungi uh, can be crucial for the success of um, uh, the use of biofertilizers. And uh, effort also should be directed toward uh, improving extension services and promoting uh, program, educating farmers uh, about the benefit and the proper use of, of biofertilizers. And um, lastly, establishing a well-organized distribution net network is uh, also important to ensure their accessibility and facilitate uh, their adoption. Uh, by focusing on this perspective, I believe that we can find a way for a more sustainable and productive future in agriculture using uh, uh, using biofertilizers. So this let this be a call to action, and uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you so much, Mariam. I'm um, very thought provoking, very interesting, and it is. It's really interesting how things are, are shaping out in the African context. Um, kindly for, for our online uh, uh, viewers who have just logged on, kindly if you have any questions for our presenters, drop them in the chat. We're going to have three presentations, two have already been done. And now we're going to move on to the last presentation that is by Dr. Anna. And then I would really ask her to share the screen or if it's going to be uh, Laura to share the screen but aside from that, as we wait for the screen to, for Anna's bio to come up, it's really interesting how um, we are feeling, um, we're able to, we're seeing how these different scientists are pushing, they're, they're forming part of the story that are pushing the frontiers in research in a new field uh, like vertical farming, where Anna is going to talk briefly about right now, the nematology and then the, the biofertilizers. And this is really exciting. And as for young scientists, it is, it is really important to see that as we are making these impactful changes, uh, we are addressing and solving problems also local to our own situations. Uh, so let's wait for Anna's bio to come up. Um, uh, Jackie, sorry, I think Anna was in the call, but um, oh, now yeah. she, oh, she's I think having she's technical. Through, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I don't um, think she's in the in the okay. call anymore. Uh, maybe okay. what we I propose that what we can do is to address maybe some of the questions that have been asked to Anik, while okay. we try to see if we can fix the connection with uh, Anna because she's in the field at the moment, so she's okay. on the go. Uh, but maybe we can, um, if someone has questions or wants to discuss something with Anik, um, um, maybe now it's the time uh, while we get Anna back if possible, okay. and also for Maria, by the way, yes. Okay. Uh, we could also start with the first question that was posed actually on the chat, um, addressed to Anik. Um, Anik, they're asking, what are the temperature and humidity conditions for the survival of both the EPN and the bacteria? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question because the success of uh, beneficial nematodes, EPN application in, field, in fields, it's really determined by many, many factors. And uh, the temperature and humidity are really part of it. You know, in the fields, we have different uh, environments. So uh, the UV, I will start with the UV radiation that we can have from sun or other sources. This is detrimental to EPM. So when we are to apply EPM, we have to make sure we protect them from this radiation. This is why usually we recommend to people to apply this beneficial nematode, whether early in the morning or in the afternoon. Also, the temperature and the moisture content of the soil, the type soil, all these factors matters. You know, desiccation, it's a very great factor that we have to look at when we talk applying EPN or when we're talking about, about EPN. When there is no water, this it affects greatly the survival of this nematode. They need water to, to be alive. But when I say that, they don't need a lot of water. When it's, there's too much water in soil, it prevents their movement. They cannot move to look for the insect host. 
So success of the application will be <laughs> will be having problem there. And also when there is too much water, there is depletion of oxygen. So it can also affect the, the survival. So these factors are really, really important when we're talking about EPN application. There are other many factors like the factors related to the nematode itself. We have to look for the right nematode for the right parasite. Like there is a specificity when we're talking about biological control agent. So that, that's why it depends on the insects, the nematode itself, as I just said, the nematode vir virulence against the specific insects pests that we touch in. The, the way, the, the ability to move through soil and look for the host. You see, so all those, all those factors come up. That's why before we relate, before we say this species of nematode can be used to control this insect, but there's a lot of research that is done down there to be sure that, yeah, it's the right one. And when we have the right one, the formulation itself, it's also a great factor to, to look at. So that's what I can say. I also say that can we use the alginate beads uh, how will that be applied? As I said, it's a PhD research, and the researcher is still carrying out a lot of, you know, experiment. But I personally think the application will not put, pose any problem because we'll just apply them. In. So we are putting them in beads now to protect them. Suppose that we are applying this bead in African in our African weather. It's fair. It can be really caught really warm. So this will protect the nematode because these nematodes are really sensitive to desiccation, as I said. So that it will be protecting them. And when we apply as beads, they will be released slowly in the ground and get adapted. So this is really possible in Africa. We have both the, bac the bacteria, the biofertilizers in there. We have the, the nematode as well. All the nematode species I talk about in my presentation related to the mango pest, they were all isolated from Benin's soil. So those are endogen nematodes, the one adapted to our climate. So now this research is focused on nematode from temperate region for European countries. But if we are to do the same, uh, you know, formulation in our context. We just go for our in, our local, you know, species. So I think it's really possible. And does it require code storage? Yes. The student is looking, the, the researcher is looking at the best temperature to store them right now and how long we can store them in the lab in this condition. She's still looking at the right condition to 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 be able to you know, uh, yeah, to be able to advise the the producers later. So that was a very 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 good good questions, and I think I cover it all. Dr. No, Anik, there is one that kind of hits home. How feasible is this study in Africa? You know, it's fascinating how the nematodes function. The beads are beautiful, but can you replicate this research back home? For example, in Benin. Where That's you come true. from. Of course, Dr. Epila. This is what I've just emphasized on to say like this research includes the use of the biofertilizers and the nematodes. And we have both. So why would we not do it? We have what about funding? If we have the means, if we have the <laughs> funds, that's the thing, that's the key, you know, fundings. If we have the facility, everything, why not? And it should be this way, actually, you know. <laughs> okay, I will get back to you. I will get yeah. back to you. Um, let, let us usher in uh, Dr. Anna. She has been able to okay. log in. She's in the field, so the network is not so stable. But um, uh, Dr. Anna, kindly, Laura, could you share us her bio? I give a brief intro, and then she can quickly get into her presentation. Thank you so much, Anik. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll just give a brief bio based on what I'm seeing. Um, Dr. Nick, 
Uh, she is working in Kenya in the Department of Horticulture and uh, Food Security. Um, uh, she's also an Open Door Fellow and her expertise is in vertical farming using artificial light. So Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, go hear? ahead. You, oh, thank you very much. Uh, really my pleasure to be here to present my uh, presentation on uh, indoor vertical farming using artificial lighting. Yes, thank you, uh, Jackie, and my uh, the presenters that have gone before me, and Nick and uh, Mariam. You've really set the stage. And uh, indeed, we have to look for all ways to ensure that we have a sustainable, healthy future, that the population is well-fed. And they're not just well-fed, but fed on nutritious food. So even as we look at um, you know, how best we can deal with nematodes, in the soil so that we can have good uh, production. Even as uh, Mariam was talking about use of biofertilizers and all the challenges, it is because we want to have a, a population that is well nourished. And um, I am also in that space. Um, and as Jackie has put it, um, yes, I am a lecturer in horticulture. So I am uh, into fruits and vegetable as, uh, research, uh, but more recently, uh, more leaning towards vegetables. And my topic is uh, looking at the indoor vertical farming and vertical farming, why vertical farming? Uh, next slide. Yes, uh, vertical farming, because we want to use as little space as we can and we have two types of vertical farms, outdoor vertical farms that are soil based, like we can see in the in the two in the uh, in the pictures uh, in the slide, uh, using the, what we call the corn gardens. We can use uh, the uh, plumbing tubes. We can use pots and also yeah, pots of different sizes. But really, the essence when we talk about vertical farming is we are stacking, you know, growing plants in stacks above one another. Um, we also have what you call the indoor vertical farms, and these ones are mainly soilless. Uh, why soilless? I think that uh, has been answered by both uh, Anik and, and Mariam, that really the soils have a lot of issues. And uh, as we are looking for solutions, uh, people need to continue feeding. And how can we do that? It's just by trying to now look at cultivations that do not uh, use soil. And um, the, that is uh, where I come in. And um, I'm looking at, uh, you know, vertical, indoor vertical farming using artificial light because we are doing it in, uh, in spaces that are not... Uh, mm -hmm not outdoor as such, but indoors. So here in these, um, uh, there can be three types. When we say uh, soilless cultivation, uh, it means that um, the nutrients that the plants would get from soil, we are providing them artificially uh, under hydroponics, and we can have aeroponics, hydroponics, or aquaponics. Uh, basically, uh, these are also different types of uh, soilless uh, cultivation methods. Um, aeroponics, basically, you're giving the plants nutrients through uh, mists. In hydroponics, the roots are immersed in the nutrient solution. And in aquaponics, in simple terms, these two systems where you have uh, fish, uh, you know, uh, in the lower uh, chambers of the system and the waters that have been fertilized by the droppings of the fish is what is fed as the nutrient solution to the plants. Next slide. Yes, uh, uh, like I said, population is growing really in Africa 
and the uh, land is becoming more and more scarce. So we need to save on space for cultivation. We need to have, uh, you know, an efficient use of all the resources of production. And um, what are those resources? Uh, mainly water, which is uh, becoming scarce and scarce with climate change. And also in Africa, we have, uh, you know, many challenges with outdoor production. We have pests, we have diseases, we have, uh, you know, bad weather at times, hail, wind, and all these are, can be destructive to uh, unprotected cultivation. And so why not go indoor? Also with this kind of system, because it's highly, uh, we are I assured of higher yields and also quality produce. And when we have quality produce, it means that the people are getting, uh, you know, good food, and so they can stay healthy lives. And this kind of uh, production system really is very ideal also for urban areas and cities. Uh, re the research has shown that uh, in the near future, uh, half the population of the African people will be in urban areas. And how will these people be getting their food? They need to adopt systems that are, uh, you know, friendly and, and can save on as much space as possible. And that is why we are looking at indoor vertical farming. Next slide, kindly. So I have looked at indoor, I have looked at vertical farming, and now why artificial lighting? Basically, in very basic terms, we know for sure that light is a very important component in, uh, in plants for making their food through the process of photosynthesis. And if you have to do production indoors, then you would not have the luxury of using sunlight. Um, and therefore to be able to achieve year round uh, production, you would have to install artificial light in, uh, the, the, in your indoor farms. And uh, light uh, basically has uh, this very uh, uh, good characteristic in that it enhances uh, the quality of leafy green vegetables and makes the production better, makes the color even more deeper, gives the, the vegetables a flavor, and also enhances the phytochemical content in those vegetables. And in recent times, the light emitting diet has been the way uh, of uh, providing that artificial lighting in indoor farm systems. Next slide. Yes, so um, my main uh, uh, you know, topic today is uh, looking at how then can we accumulate these phytonutrients into those uh, vegetables uh, because phytonutrients are very important for healthy, for health, for health. So next slide, let's see what goes on. Next slide. Yes, uh, I decided to put this slide in so that we can see how, uh, you know, plants respond to different light quality. And uh, you can see from the spectra from 400 to 750 nanometers, you can see that uh, different phytochemicals are actually uh, synthesized. For example, at seven, uh, 725 to 735, you get more of the chlorophyll uh, not synthesized, uh, also carotenoids, but more of the glucosinolates. Um, uh, if I go down to the UVA, the 320 to 400, you get more nitrates and you get more anthocyanides. So basically, we are trying to say that at different light quality, you get different phytochemicals synthesized. And therefore, light is a very key component. Next. also another uh, brief overview of uh, how these phytonutrients are synthesized in, in, in plants. And uh, I just want to bring to our attention the fact that uh, research 
has shown that uh, there is a, a benefit in consuming uh, phytochemicals. Uh, if, uh, for example, a diet rich in polyphenols is taken over time, then it can protect our bodies against certain cancers, cardiovascular diseases, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, pancreatitis, uh, pan pancreatitis, sorry, uh, that word is difficult, uh, gastrointestinal uh, problems, lung damage, and uh, also some neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, simply, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are saying that if you take uh, products or plants that have been grown uh, properly and have uh, accumulated these polyphenols, then you can be able to protect your body against some of the very alarming diseases that uh, are very rampant uh, presently. Next slide. So in my experiment, I did, uh, uh, you know, use a different light quality to try and monitor, uh, you know, the, the accumulation of some of these phytonutrients in plants. I used the red light, uh, the blue light, and the white light. And uh, simply the experiment was uh, in uh, indoor, in a lab in Ghent University. Next slide. Uh, the experiment uh, showed that indeed light quality had uh, effect on on shoot weight. Uh, I did uh, you know the experiment on three uh, vegetables: arugula, lettuce, and watercress, and uh, the results were clear that uh, light quality. Um, you know, for example, in arugula, the blue light had uh, the greatest effect on shoot weight. In lettuce, the red light had greater effect. And in watercress, the blue light had greater effect on shoot weight. What does this also mean? It means that different plants also, uh, you know, uh, respond different in, to light quality. And so the light quality for one vegetable as the standard for all of them. And there is therefore a need for a lot of research on uh, artificial lighting in plants. Next slide. I will pass this slide because uh, it's also just showing the kind of uh, phytochemicals that we looked at, carotenoids, anthocyanine, and uh, chlorophyll. And really the different plants did respond differently um, uh, and this uh, is a, a wake-up call, something to show us that uh, there are differences in uh, in the response of plants to light, uh, because you can see uh, differences between cultivars even of the same species, and research has also shown this. Next slide. Uh, now that we are in Africa, I am in Kenya. I am talking about research in, in Kenya. And uh, I am talking about a system that is very high tech. And I can see Jackie nodding her head because she's like, so how does this even happen? High uh, tech vertical farms can actually cost a lot of money. And uh, this is money that is not present in Africa now. We have other things that we are looking at. Uh, and one of those really is health. Oh. Hello, think, Anna? Yeah, I think we've lost. Uh... OK, it's a glitch, I'm assuming. Um, and yet she was getting to the heart of the matter, you know, the, the money. Anna, are you there? Okay. Yeah, I think it's the it's her connection. Yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 But she's not sorry to the audience. She hasn't dropped. Yeah. So yeah. maybe she she's not even aware that. Um, yes. I hope yeah. she's getting us.
something just happened. I have no idea what that was. Uh, maybe it's, <laughs> it's to emphasize my challenge. <laughs> My number three challenge that uh, there is a lack of access to reliable energy sources. <laughs> yes, which is really a very uh, vital uh, part uh, due to frequent power cuts. Yes, internet connectivity also some issues there, but uh, uh, we have to uh, scale uh, these challenges and ensure that the population gets, uh, you know, uh, to feed healthy food. Uh, next slide. So um, I have suggested uh, so few, a few solutions that can make us uh, uh, surmount this challenge of uh, putting up indoor vertical farms in Africa. We can do research and select low light adapted species focus mainly on increasing uh, renewable uh, energy sources to run and power these farms, lobby for financial and technological support from governments and the private sector. And uh, one of way of lobbying is by me speaking to you uh, about this uh, so that uh, we can get partners to run such uh, experiments. Uh, also, you know, opt for more simplified vertical cultivation solutions. So we need more innovations in this area so that uh, the systems can run uh, under the, you know, just using locally available materials and also exploiting urban water sources, harvesting the rainwater or reusing, uh, you know, the uh, thermal, you know, mass that, uh, in, in builders' uh, spaces. So um, I, I think this is doable and uh, uh, Africa must move from, you know, just uh, the normal costly productive farming systems towards uh, sustainable int intensification and eco-friendliness. And indeed one such system is uh, the indoor vertical farming uh, using artificial lighting. Next slide. Um, this slide uh, shows the green. If you see deep green, it means that um, the countries are very, uh, visi they, they have a high visibility of adopting indoor vertical farms. I have circled Kenya because uh, it is uh, termed to be favorable. Uh, for um, adopting uh, indoor vertical farming. I'm saying Kenya is ready. Let's collaborate. Let's feed this growing urban population sustainably. I, as a researcher, I am ready. Who else wants to come on this bandwagon so that we can be able to do more research and give solutions uh, to our people? so that we have a population that is healthy, secure, and uh, yes, moving forward in all areas. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, everyone who is here listening to me and uh, of course, all our partners, and we look forward to more collaborations. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Jackie. Uh, thank you, Anna. Very thought-provoking. I actually thought you had, uh, you know, when you go to the gist of it, uh, the aspect of the technology. Um, and I want to remind our online uh, viewers that you can always drop in your questions in the chat. And while you do that, Anna, I have a, a question for you. Uh, you've talked about the money and the readiness of Kenya, but do you have a policy in place regarding this vertical farming? You know, this is a new sort of like farming. This is the future, actually. This is where we're supposed to be. So is there any policy in Kenya regarding this? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jackie. Uh, we have a research policy in Kenya. And uh, the research policy in Kenya really looks at whether whatever research is, uh, the, the, is that is being done is ethical. And by all standards, indoor vertical farming is very ethical. And so we have really strong policy 
that is supporting uh, this kind of research, uh, only that the money isn't flowing as it should, but more speaking about, as we continue speaking about it, we, we are hoping that uh, the, the money that is even allocated to universities for research uh, through the research council can be increased. Thank you very much. So there's policy in place. You have another question that is on the chat. They're asking, what is the recommended duration of light exposure for crops in indoor vertical farms? Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for example, the research that I did in, uh, in Ghent and in any other places that we've been to, uh, the, the, there is... Um, the, the, the light uh, is exposed to the plants uh, throughout throughout the growing period. It's exposed to the, the, the plants throughout the growing period. Because if you do not uh, expose it to, to light, then uh, um, you're, you're, you're likely then to interfere with the synthesis of some of these phytochemicals. But using LEDs, LEDs are really very energy saving and also the, the, the quality of the light is, uh, uh, is not as strong as the solar one, if I may put it that way in very layman language. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Anna. Um, my question goes to Mariam. Mariam talked about biofertilizers. Mariam, do you think the notion of a leveled playing field in terms of research an innovation exists in that in the context of your biofertilizers and also in the context of Africa. Um, I think that achieving a fully leveled uh, play field in research and innovation is a complex goal um, because I think we need, uh, first of all, to address the, some related disparities in resources. Um, technologies, access, education, training, and effort toward uh, international collaboration, uh, knowledge sharing are crucial steps uh, in promoting uh, and advancing innovation in Africa. So it's feasible, but we need to address some barriers in order to achieve. Oh, thank you. and. Um... I see there is a connection between your presentation on biofertilizers and Anik's presentations on the nematodes. And do you think as a, a biofertilizer expert now, I might assume, do you think you might want to in future perhaps collaborate with um, Anik? Because it seems you guys are doing the same thing, but uh, you know, and if you came together, I, I think we'd produce wonders for Africa. Yeah, I realized that there is uh, some interplays uh, between biofertilizers and nematodes uh, because some biofertilizers act as uh, uh, what we call biocontrol agents against nematodes. Uh, they may produce components that are uh, toxic uh, to bat nematodes and help uh, the growth of the plant. On the other hand, also, uh, Anik mentioned that uh, we have, uh, I think she, she said, beneficial nematode. And these type of nematode, I believe, can collaborate with uh, biofertilizers and contribute to the balance and healthier ecosystem, soil ecosystem. So, yeah, I definitely agree that uh, we can collaborate uh, on that specific topic to see uh, how these uh, different settings can, yeah. Work. So, yeah. And Anik is nodding. Anik, do you have something to say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course, the collaboration will be really great, I think. That's why we are having this platform now to discuss and share knowledge and, you know, educate also ourselves. So the good thing also about this EPN is that, as I mentioned, the um, effective stage of the EPN happens in soil. And this biofertilizers, I mean, so sometimes when we isolate EPN and try to see the microbes, the microorganisms living on their skin, we found these biofertilizers on it. So naturally in soil, this combination, this, you know, way of combining the two, it's already happening, you know, so it will be really, really good idea to investigate this more, especially in our context in Africa. Thank you. 
Thank you well, so much. Um, oh, go ahead. Somebody had a question. Yeah, it's me, Jackie. Oh, please go ahead, Anna. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, I, I just want to say that uh, all these are really indeed interrelated. And uh, I'm looking at, uh, you know, if a product comes out of uh, uh, Anik's work uh, or, uh, and, and, and Mariam's work, and this product is used in our vertical farms, Definitely. you know, <laughs> so, so, so that we, 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 we are having uh, homegrown solutions uh, to some of uh, the, the problems that we have. Um, I think that would be very, very powerful. Yes. Um, so there is really an interconnection between uh, the three. Oh, well. Very interesting. As a plant scientist as well as a chemist, I'm interested in that because this is where my worlds meet, and Nick's, Mariam's, and Anna's. Uh, and I'm, I'm still I'm waiting for questions on the chat. Uh, do we have some? Um, if you're interested in asking any of our presenters a question, please drop it on the chat. And also within the chat, we have um, the aspect of um, we've put their bio data, your credentials. If you want to get in touch with either Anik, Mariam, or Anna, kindly find that the more information on them on the chat um somebody has um put a comment yeah ah that the impact on biochar to suppress okay that's the bad nematodes and then promote good nematodes seems very promising but under researched looking forward to seeing more uh, so you really anik and uh mariam and anna you know the future is bright and we're waiting for your solutions back home because that is the, at the end of the day, we need also solutions that fit in our context. Um, and, and, and on that note, um, I would like to um, ask um, um, Anik, could you tell us just briefly your journey? You know, I don't think you started with your nematodes in, in Ireland. I think it, you had a route to it. And uh, I, I would really be interested. I'm really interested in the nematodes. It's, it's something fascinating. I only knew elephantiasis but I didn't know it was caused by the nematodes. And therefore, I don't know if you could just briefly just tell us something small about yourself, your journey with science and how you have gotten to where you are today. Thank you, Dr. Etela. Yeah, my journey has not been straight as you just mentioned. I didn't start uh, nematodes initially. You know, it all started in Ghent. In Ghent, where I got a scholarship, I moved to Ghent and studied nematodes in general. I did a master in nematodes, two years master's, and that's where I learned all aspects of nematodes, how we can use them to, you know, sustainably control insect pests, how we can control like this bad nematodes and which role this nematode play in the environmental sustainability using them as bioindicators. And after the master's, I'm like, no, it, it's too good to stop just there. I have to continue. So I apply for a PhD, a PhD scholarship provided by the Ghent University. And I luckily got it, did a four and a half years of research again to obtain my PhD uh, certificate, my PhD diploma. But after that, yes, of course, it's uh, the time to go back home and apply some of the knowledge that I gathered during my journey, my PhD and master journey. So I joined back my, my university in Benin back home, focusing on few projects, uh, especially the one I mentioned that we formulate in this nematode in mango orchard. Do we still have uh, Jackie? Um, I think she's, something. No, she's there. She's there, but sometimes, okay. like the connection, they are. Yeah, she's back. Okay. 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 No, please go ahead. I think it's it's. Yeah, we are in okay. Africa. We, we expect this. So, go ahead, so please. That's where I applied all of the knowledge that I gathered during my research journey, looking at the formulation of this nematode, how we can pre protect the mango, you know, trees using this nematode and have more yield and all sort of this. But you know, for career development, you reach a point that you want more international experience. So 
after four or five years working back home, I joined Ireland one year ago as a postdoctoral researcher in the Southeast Technological University. Where I'm using now, I'm now using these same nematodes, but as bioindicators. So it's like, you know, broadening up my knowledge and my research expertise in the, sa in the same field of this beneficial nematode. But there is something Anna just pointed out, and I want to elaborate a bit more on it. It's um, in the context of Africa, what are the challenges? I think the main challenge that I have and I can share here, it's uh, we don't have that much support from the government. What do I mean by that? You know, the beauty of the science we have been talking about, moving from nematode to biofertilizers, the vertical, you know, all these things. We need money. We need money to run the research. We need a lot of money. But we don't have this financial support. And sometimes even if you're so, you know, excited about your research and you have so many great ideas, you find yourself limited. Maybe because you don't have that money, you don't have the facilities, you don't have that support that you need because research is not easy. You need all those things, but you don't have those. So you find yourself in a place that you have to look for support outside. The research I'm doing now in the, using these nematodes as bioindicators, I could be doing the same thing in Benin. If I have all the means, I'm I'm uh, working under the founding of the government of Ireland, founded my research right now. And uh, I read that the Irish government spent about 750 million euros every year just by supporting their researchers. Can you imagine, like, you know, that's just for the government. And Ireland is just a small country. If we have to compare it uh, with the other big European countries, it's a very small country. So they put that money just from the government. I'm not talking about the EU, the one the European Union is injecting, or all the external, you know, founding bodies that they are also using. So what are we doing to our researchers' home? I think we really need the support, Dr. Epila, from our, uh, from, from our, I, I don't know how bad the situation is in East Africa, but in the West, where I come from, like you find yourself just stranded, like you cannot move forward. So it's, it's, it's really not a good, uh, you know, situation. We have to make things work further, especially for the future generation. It's like, it has to be better to help them you know, to, to really carry out this research and found and try to find a, you know, sustainable solution for our, our problem. So thank you so much for asking that question. <laughs> yeah. oh, thank you so much, Anik. And now um, I have um, questions for, for the two ladies, Mariam and Anna. Um, what are your expectations for the future? And how can people get in touch with you if they would like to collaborate with you. So we would, um, I would start with Mariam and then we would work our way finally to Anna. So Mariam, the floor is yours, thank you. Uh, my ex expectation for the future, I think the, uh, our government need really to invest in the use of biofertilizers, especially in Africa, in some countries. And I am saying that because I am working on biofertilizer, but in European Union context, just to highlight what Anik mentioned, there is a lot of investment going on related to the use of biofertilizers in Europe, but not in Africa. So uh, I think that, yeah, there is an advantage of learning more, knowing more, but using this knowledge in our countries. So this is something that I would like to apply in the future. In, especially in Senegal and more in other African uh, countries, if possible. And uh, yeah, I will share my email in the chat box if uh, for collaboration and I'm open, of course, for, for collaboration. Thank you, 
over to you. Thank you, uh, Thank you Mariam. Um, Anna, um, could you kindly tell us the future, what the future looks like for vertical farming in Africa and in Kenya, and how can people get in touch with you? Thank you. Yeah, I was, I was first of all trying to share so that people can see my face, my video, but oh, it's not coming. However, oh. <laughs> our, um, our, you know, um, I shared two types of vertical farms, outdoor vertical farms and indoor vertical farms. To be very honest with you, outdoor vertical farms have already gained a lot of uh, you know, mileage, uh, acceptability and adoption among the people, especially those in urban areas. Um, I look 10 years to come and um, indoor vertical farming will be a big thing. I look forward to, uh, you know, we are developing, Africa is developing and uh, we have major malls rising up from every of the cities that we have. I don't know about uh, you, Jackie, in Kampala. I'm in Kampala. I'm in Uganda now. Hope to explore Kampala and, and see your bigger malls. But in Nairobi, we have very big malls. In all those malls, you will find a grocery store, a grocery store in every of them selling vegetables. I look forward to having an indoor farm in every of those I mean, in every of those uh, big malls, so that the consumer is the, is is getting their fresh vegetables right there. And this can only be possible if we have all the facts right about the quality of these vegetables, about the life that is needed for each of those species. And so I just I sit and and I just see a very bright future if. Like you asked, if the policies that have been put down on paper about research funding can now move to implementation and we see it happening so that we can churn out the right information for entrepreneurs who would want to get into this space. So thank you very much. The future is bright. We have to keep talking and we'll keep talking loud. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Anna. And the, really the take home I get from this, we should actually move away from the research and then we focus on the end goal being a product because with Mariam, there's a product, in Anix, there's a product and in Anna, we have fresh produce right in our, our supermarkets. So I think that is where we should now be heading. We have, we, we have one, we're wonderful researchers. We can do everything in the lab, but we should translate it into a product that it is, that is consumable or that is, can be used in any field. Um, so I really like to say thank you to all our presenters. Um, thank you VIB, IPBO for allowing us, you know, kind of have this discussion. And also the speaking science course has really shaped us. Uh, we're trying, uh, but it has really shaped us into the women we are today. And I'm proud of us. I think, we are, I think the rest of us are also proud of ourselves of what we've become. So um, the floor is uh, now yours, uh, Laura, for the final uh, wrap up before we close. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jackie. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I want to thank um, everyone who is still uh, with us here. We have uh, our audience and also um, to Anik, Mariam and Anna for sharing their their science and uh, Anna was uh, struggling with this connection in, in, in Uganda, but Thanks God we we had her with us today. And thank you, Jackie, because you've been also the organizer and arranging things behind the scenes. So your your role was was fundamental to get this webinar. And um, yeah, let's call it a, a webinar today uh, on sustainable farming practices in you know um, implying nematode management, uh, EPNs, uh, biofertilizers and vertical farming systems, and hope to see you very soon online and in the in this community that we are creating now. So goodbye, everybody. Have a lovely day, wherever you are. And let's be in touch, please. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Bye. Oh, we can see you, Anna. Oh, well, yeah. Anna, Anna, Anna. <laughs> oh. Nice. Anna, you're near nice a
Ai, finally, finally. 